Good morning. It's Tuesday, the 9th of January, and this is Govind Raj Ethiraj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for this completely packed day on news and insights. Global markets pause on strong US jobs numbers and high bond yields. India's auto sales hold momentum. Two-wheeler sales strong despite a slowdown in agricultural growth. India's exports may drop by close to 7% thanks to blockages on the red sea and the suez canal and saudi arabia unexpectedly cuts oil prices as demand weakens has boeing compromised safety in its 737 model a pilot's view real estate major dlf sells over 1000 flats for 7000 crore rupees or over 7 crore rupees per flat in a single location over 3 days and 38 year olds help mercedes clock record car sales for 2023 in india this is a core report with govindraj athiraj markets down saudi cuts oil prices Equity markets declined on Monday amidst a weakness in global indices that's indices all over the world global equities have now fallen the most since October on speculation that the Federal Reserve was in no rush to reduce interest rates further catalysts may come from a US inflation print that's due on Thursday or inflation numbers and an earnings season that kicks off on Friday in the United States with big names like JP Morgan Chase and Citigroup Bloomberg said India of course will have its own earnings season kicking off today. The BSE Sensex fell 671 points to settle at 71355 while the Nifty 50 ended at 21513 down 198 points. So the triggers just to return to the world at large seem to be flowing from Wall Street and that general vicinity. The US jobs market is reporting strong numbers including a rise in average hourly earnings thanks to which the yield on 10 year bonds in the United States has gone up thanks to which the probability of a rate cut in March this year has come down according to the CME Fed watch tool. All of this means that capital is less likely to seek distant investment avenues which of course includes markets like India. Now all this of course bear in mind is relative and no one is predicting or even suggesting any major outbound flows. The overall structural fundamentals for the Indian economy and markets are of course exactly as they were last week where we were generally celebrating 22000 on the Nifty and 72000 on the Sensex. Saudi Arabia cuts oil prices and now our India Energy Week energy segment the unexpected has happened Saudi Arabia has cut official selling prices of crude oil by more than an expected 2 dollars a barrel highlighting weak demand conditions which outweighed the red sea tensions its pricing is the lowest since November 2021 bloomberg reported global benchmark brent fell below 78 dollars a barrel after rising 2.2% last week and was quoting a shade over $76 a barrel overnight moreover oil speculators have now turned bearish ramping up short positions against both the brent and the wti bloomberg said vandana hari singapore based oil analyst and founder of vanda insights told reuters that the red sea tensions are the only counterweight albeit a relatively weak and intermittent one to crude prices succumbing to bearishness over expectations of softening global demand and rising inventories put differently if there were no red sea tensions as we are seeing them today oil prices would likely fall much further or even crash meanwhile india may see around 30 billion dollars shaved off its total merchandise exports in the current fiscal year as threats to cargo vessels in the red sea lead to a surge in container shipping rates and prompt exporters to hold back on shipments bloomberg quoted insights from the research and information system for developing countries a new delhi based think tank The government of India hasn't released any official estimates on the impact of the Red Sea crisis on Indian exports as yet but we will return to this subject shortly. The number of ships passing through the Suez Canal is down about 44% compared to the average for the first half of December according to Clarkson Research Services a unit of the world's largest ship broker Bloomberg said. The energy segment was supported by India Energy Week to be held from February 6th and more details are at www.indianergyweek.com December auto sales come in strong 
India's auto sales numbers are still going strong, holding the momentum they picked up in the 2023 festival season that started around the Navratra festival in October. Retail auto sales in India have now jumped 21% in December 23, according to data released by the Federation of Automobile Dealers Associations on Monday. Sales in December 23 were, however, 30% lower than November. All categories of vehicles are doing well. Two-wheelers rose 28%, three-wheelers 36% and passenger vehicles 3%. While overall agricultural growth numbers have been weak, thanks also to a weak monsoon, the money in hands of farmers appears to be growing or at least steady as seen in two-wheeler sales numbers and we'll come to that shortly. In 2023-2, all segments reported a positive growth. Two-wheelers grew 9%, three-wheelers almost 58%, cars 11% and so on. I spoke with Manish Raj Singhania, President at the Federation of Automobile Dealers Associations based out of Raipur in Chhattisgarh and I began by asking him what was keeping this momentum strong and whether December was unusual in any way. So December has been a pretty good one for the auto retail industry with the overall growth of almost 21% and best part was two-wheeler growth was almost at 20% and EV growth was almost at 3%. So Two-wheeler was a segment that was uh, lagging till August, but since the advent of festival season, the two-wheeler segment has been responding well, and dealers have been able to maintain a very decent or attractive build-up stock of almost near to 15 days. We had a fantastic festivals and Lavratha on the tennis went up very well. We were a bit pessimistic about December and we were worried how will that this December and offer perform because it came after a gap of almost three years with COVID times and vehicles and booking, there were hardly any December offers. But this time with the huge build-up stock of at the dealership, uh, the December offers really came in and uh, it made a mark. And last week of December has been pretty good. Not many new records, but definitely for three-wheeler industry. It was ever highest December, you know, that was a new record for the three-wheeler sales. So overall, uh, uh, happy and good December for auto retail. Yeah, and three-wheeler seems to be a sustained trend. So what's driving this? I mean, is it the momentum following or continuing from the festive season? Or is it something else that's driving it the way you're seeing it? Actually, a couple of things here. First of all, three-wheeler industry has totally transited to EV retails now. Almost 55% of three-wheeler retails are EV now. So that's a huge change. And... Why, when one was purchasing an ICE three-wheeler, permit was required in a particular city to operate. But central government has exempted the three-wheeler, the electric three-wheeler from permit system. And we know the transport situation or the local transport situation in our cities. It is hardly, you know, present. Very few buses in dilapidated conditions, very bad conditions. And so three-wheeler has been a very seeing mode of transport, catching to that last my mobility solution. And also after COVID, what happened? A lot of people lost a lot of em- employment. Here was a segment which had good potential, good earning. People are comfortably, you know, earning decent amount per month in, for a three-wheeler load or passenger. And also the advent of uh, players like Amazon and such kind of players which have kind of instigated the three-wheeler industry. So all this has contributed towards the youth growth of Greenwheeler, which is now every month you can see the numbers hovering around 98 or 1 lakh vehicle per month. That's a youth number for this industry. But they're being used for both people as well as for goods, right? Even in this electric category? Right, right. Both. Load as well as passenger carrying, both. Right. Okay. And if to go back to two-wheelers, which was a segment which was slow for the best part of last year, What's the trigger that's driving purchases and the growth that you're seeing? I think first was both the festival season. During festival, we have observed that consumers really come out and buy vehicles in India during Bharat's time. Secondly, also, uh, since when we changed ad from BS4 to BS6, and there was a lot of stress in the economic and especially the lower state of the society. So the new price point, initial BS4, two-wheeler was costing around anywhere around 38000 Now the new BS6, two-wheelers, entry-level are costing around 64000 65000 That new price point needs to get established in the mind of the consumer. 
and after that continuously had some decent cropping seasons we didn't have a bad season as such where we really lost a lot of crops we did have very good seasons but we have had decent season with good quality and quantity of crop and plus the msp has been increased by the central government and this increase in msp has resulted in increased fund flow in rural economy please understand that 70% of the two wheeler industry two wheeler retails are contributed by rural india bharat of india so if that is kicking and moving then only the two wheeler industry will move and plus we had some elections in the four five states these also contributed 90% of this benefit of election i should say election purchase goes to the two wheeler industry so that has also given up further a perpetuous any trend that stood out to you specifically which you feel is reflect some kind of shift in what consumers are buying this is across categories whether it's two or four or three and that could continue into 24 i think the luxury and suv segment will continue to perform well lot of new launches planned in that segment that it has shifted towards that segment but what is interesting is still a lot of kind of you know strength left in the rural market and last three years rural market has not been performing well and that this kind of trace that what we are seeing continues and we have a decent monsoon in this next calendar year i think rural market will also come into the play and overall auto industry would be hugely benefited right manish thank you so much for joining me thank you thank you boeing faces more safety questions Officials have recovered a panel that blew off an Alaska Airlines airliner triggering a partial grounding of Boeing's 737 Max 9 aircraft Reuters is reporting. A door plug tore off last week after takeoff from Portland, Oregon en route to Ontario and California in the United States depressurizing the plane and forcing pilots to turn back from around 16,000 feet. The aircraft with 171 passengers and 6 crew on board landed safely. The US Federal Aviation Administration or FAA on Saturday ordered the temporary grounding of about 171 Boeing Max 9 jets installed with that same panel which weighs about 27 kilograms and covers an optional exit door. Interestingly, the 737's cockpit voice recorder did not apparently capture any data because it had been overwritten because it captures only 2 hours of data as per current mandates. Boeing shares fell as much as 8% in pre-market US trade on Monday. Five years ago, all Max family jets worldwide were grounded following two fatal crashes. About 215 737 Max 9 jets are in service worldwide, according to aviation analytics firm Sirium. Only about 171 feature that plug door that was blown out during the flight, said Reuters. I reached out to pilot and aviation safety advocate Captain Amit Singh, and I began by asking him how he was viewing the Alaska Air incident. Well, you can view. this incident in two ways specific to the particular airline and the aircraft or in terms of holistic safety culture which prevails in the us where the aircraft is manufactured so if you look at this particular incident what flew off was a plug it is not a door so the head of ntsb just clarified that it is not a door it is a door plug which has two hinges at the bottom it is supposed to open only 15 degrees for some maintenance activity and nothing else but there are additional six kind of locks on both sides so 12 locks which hold this plug in place so with the hinges and the 12 additional devices to hold the plug why did it blow out is kind of a serious issue the ntsb head has also briefed that there have been three past instances of pressurization auto fail light illuminating which means there was some malfunction in the pressurization system now they're trying to find out if this is related to the plug or not but there was some issue last week we saw another issue of a missing bolt a nut in the rudder which is a very critical structure in the aircraft and another aircraft which was not delivered the same nut was found to be loose so this points out to quality control in the production stage which means that at the production stage there is something missing 
in terms of activity or monitoring oversight by the regulator and the company itself is not able to produce same quality or high standards of aircraft we have seen it in the other fleet 787 wherein one of the airline refused to take deliveries of 787 from one particular assembly line or factory because they said the quality there is not up to standards so there have been a number of issues if i go back to the 1980s the boeing 737 had issues with the rudder wherein there were number of accidents and loss of lives because of the rudder failing at critical stages of flight and boeing paid a huge compensation that stage whereas legally they were granted immunity for any failure which was due to a third party issue so if they had outsourced the production of the rudder to somebody else and the failure happened they had no liability but they still paid millions of dollars compensation what aircraft have you been flying or most recently been flying i have flown the 737 200s which was the original and i have flown the boeing 777 and right now i'm flying the airbus 320 and so i've flown the dar range if you were to look at this incident now in the context of overall safety now this as you said it's you described it as a plug which came off now this is obviously part of the body and the fuselage now where would you it is serious i mean i guess there's no relative seriousness in this but how would you rank this in terms of let's say people flying or wondering whether to ever sit in a boeing 737 again yeah, so this is a very serious issue because luckily nobody was sitting on those seats next to the plug so what the head of ntsb has described that the plug basically blew off at uh, about 16500 feet which is a relatively low height wherein the differential pressure is not much had it blown off at 35000 feet the effect would have been much higher so at this stage 16000 feet internal panels were ripped off insulation was ripped off certain seat cover then other things were ripped off because of the sudden and we call it explosive decompression which means when the structure fails and suddenly with a bang the aircraft just depressurizes so had it happened at cruising height of 35 37 or even higher it would have been people could have been sucked out because at that stage there might be people not wearing seat belts or moving around or the crew could have been sucked out which has happened in the past loha airlines that was also a boeing where in the roof basically gave way due to corrosion so this is a very serious issue and also because there have been other instances of quality control so we don't know what next is going to happen after the lion air accident the whole mcas issue came to the fore and how pilots were unaware of mcas being installed on their craft and they were not trained about it but there was only one country in the world which was training pilots that was brazil and that too in collaboration with the americans boeing and fa so how was it that brazil knew about it because they produce aircrafts and they have an independent evaluation board the rest of the world depends upon whatever the us regulator the fa comes out with the regulations and recommendations they have blindly accepted that since they have certified so on the basis of that certification we accept it india also does the same whatever fa or easa the european regulator says so we say since we don't have the capability to independently evaluate we accept there so but fa has had issues of basically over trusting boeing and in the process there was issues of fire on the 787 batteries because of again quality issues so why does it keep happening on the boeing again and again so my only question is there could be another component which we are not aware that could fail because of the same process issues the quality control could affect something else because in two weeks we have seen two different issues coming to fore there could be another third thing which we are not aware we cannot predict because safety right now is at a stage wherein it has to be at a prediction stage that we see the trend so we can predict what next so safety has a reactive so boeing is working on a reactive stage if something happens then we will do something but they have to be ideally at proactive and predictive stage since their production and control process the fa does not have adequate oversight 
and capability in terms of technical know-how. They are dependent on Boeing, so they cannot kind of predict. And Boeing is not open about what processes they are following or not. Like we have seen the leak emails with the Max, wherein there were emails sent that the regulator, international regulator, should not know about these things, and we should basically hide some fact and push into production the aircraft. So it's all about trust issues. They themselves do not care for their quality. Right, uh, Captain Singh, uh, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Indian pilots get a breather. Pilot safety has been in the spotlight in India after an unusually high number of deaths of pilots across Indian airlines, apparently because of fatigue-triggered cardiac conditions and a general increase in reported fatigue. The Directorate General of Civil Aviation in India on Monday introduced new flight duty regulations under which weekly rest hours for pilots have increased from 36 hours per week to 48 hours. It's also reduced the maximum flight time for pilots to fly at night in a day to 8 hours and cut down maximum landings by a pilot in a day to two. After in-depth analysis of pilot rosters, fatigue-related reports, and direct feedback from pilots, we've introduced new regulations that include increased rest periods, redefined night duty, and regular fatigue reports to be shared by airlines, India's civil aviation minister said. The new norms that have been shared with airlines have to be complied with from June 1st or by June 1st. DLF sells record number of flats again. Here on, I'm thinking that instead of saying something is selling like hotcakes, I will say something is selling like flats in Gurgaon. Real estate major DLF said that it had sold 1,113 luxury apartments in Gurgaon that adjoins Delhi for about 7,200 crores within just three days of its pre-launch, which means the flats are not even there to see. The flats were sold in its newest luxury residential development, that's DLF Privana. This is not the first time DLF has sold out flats in this manner. Last March, it sold 1,137 luxury apartments costing 7 crore rupees and more in another housing project in Gurgaon for about 8,000 crores in three days. DLF has now launched a new project called DLF Privana South, which is spread over 25 acres in Gurgaon again. Now, there have been a few other reported cases of rapidly selling out real estate projects, including in the south of India. The DLF numbers are, of course, in sync with what we are seeing in overall real estate sales numbers, which is strong numbers in both value and volume of sales across the country. The Delhi NCR Gurgaon market, and more specifically Gurgaon, of course, has seen a resurgence in values of a kind which many may not have anticipated. Mercedes reports record sales. Speaking of record sales, Mercedes-Benz will launch some 12 new models this year, which have done well thanks to young, affluent Indians, officials said on Monday. Mercedes said that nearly 25% of its sales came from vehicles costing 1 crore rupees and over, and it sold 3,500 of them last year and has a backlog of about 6,000 crores, according to Money Control, the website. A Mercedes official told Reuters that there is an evolving customer profile, the demographics and changing, and there is a lot of aspiration from young achievers to straight away get to the top end segment of luxury. Mercedes buyers in India have an average age of 38, are typically business owners, but the number of purchasers who are salaried professionals has climbed steadily to account for 12 to 14 percent of buyers, the German auto major said. Now, while this is Mercedes, my sense is that the numbers would be somewhat similar or could be compared to the numbers at Audi and BMW. Mercedes officials also said that India's mini metro cities are future growth engines and the company wants to open new service workshops in some of these places like Udaipur, Amritsar and Agra. Well, that's it from me on this packed edition. See you tomorrow. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopses or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening. <laughs>